performances on topics covering the arts, culture, history, science, and more. Uh, our next evening sessions is going to be on Wednesday, May 5th, uh, 6.30, Zoom only. Uh, that theme is going to be Turn the Page, the Bob Seeger Story, presented by the uh, Edward S. Balian. Uh, his book tracks a half century of Seeger's music career from his earliest days, playing Detroit area gymnasiums through his 2019 national tour. Uh, here inside stories and interview info about Bob's composing, changing band members, recording sessions, tours, and his very private personal life. Uh, tonight, I would like to present to you uh, Chris Siriano, who is the founder and director of the House of David Museum in St. Joseph, Michigan. Uh, he is going to discuss his books and documentary film about Michigan's apocalyptic House of David cult, which became famous more for baseball than religious radicalism. So, thank you, Chris, for joining us. And my pleasure. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, thanks for having me on. It's uh, absolutely fascinating uh, piece of Michigan history and I'm glad to have the opportunity to share that with everyone. Um, I'm here in the museum and I'm going to unplug and flip my phone around. Um, I like to start the tours. This is the main uh, entry room here into the museum where we start tours uh, by giving everybody a little bit of a flair of uh, the beginning of the story. And uh, if you look up on the very top, uh, the sound that's a replica of the sounding board uh, at the Silver Beach Carousel Museum that tells the gist of the House of David story, which started with Benjamin Purnell and his wife, Mary. And they came from Paducah, Kentucky in uh, uh, a really destitute, time for their families. They arrived in Benton Harbor in this covered wagon, uh, which Benjamin is there standing in front of the wagon. And uh, that's his daughter uh, and his son, daughter Hetty, son Coy. Um, Benjamin was a broom maker by trade, but he was an itinerant preacher that uh, came from uh, fire and brimstone type uh, upbringing. And um, he loved to give talks on street corners, uh, preaching his word. There's a close up of him and Mary. There's Benjamin in his park. Uh, there's one of the mansions that he built for himself and his people. Um, anyway, the whole thing started in eight, 1861 with Benjamin's birth. Um, he arrived in Benton Harbor in 1902 and founded the House of David in 1903, um, at which time he gathered quite a huge number of people for their in-gathering um, as he announced the beginning of the House of David. And uh, I've got all kinds of different uh, original teachings from the book, uh, the black book right there uh, about Joanna Southcott. Uh, John Rowe, James Jezreel. There were many people that came before Benjamin uh, that talked about this millennialist type faith. Um, there's the what, when, where, and how of the House of David. And it was, it was a bit of a confusing faith for many people. Um, it, I call it a form of Christianity. He named it the House of David. It was a millennialist type faith where if you believed in Benjamin and his teachings, um, you lived a life of Christianity, you were celibate, and you vowed to believe in him as your messenger from God, that you would live a thousand years of paradise on earth and you would have what he called eternal life of the body. Um, people flocked from all over the world to join the faith. And uh, because they had believed in these other people that came before Benjamin, um, the roots were set down pretty deep and all over the world. And once he announced the arrival of what he called himself the seventh messenger, that was, that was long awaited in the teachings of all these other people. And so they flocked from everywhere around the globe 
to give what they had, all their worldly possessions, all their knowledge and expertise, and uh, the rest of their life they donated to the, uh, this faith. And um, it's pretty powerful. So um, I wrote a book about it. Uh, there's the cover of my book there. It's just called The House of David by Arcadia Publishing. Um, I wrote a couple other books that are currently sold out about the House of David. Uh, made a documentary for PBS that aired back in 2010. And we are just in the process of another documentary as we speak um, that we hope to air in the coming year or less on PBS, which they've already committed to and possibly the History Channel. So um, it's pretty fascinating history. It, uh, it started out with the plan of the faith um, and uh, grew by leaps and bounds. They had a huge pre-Disneyland type amusement park with 11 of these little steam engine trains um, that they built right there uh, at the House of David grounds themselves. Uh, they had orchestras and bands and vaudeville shows. Uh, here's a cool picture of a vaudeville act. Um, they made their own stringed instruments. They made banjos and ukuleles, violins, uh, bass fiddles, and they had amazing talent. There's Chick Bell, uh, who came from Australia to uh, lead the orchestra. Um, and that, that all began with uh, the arrival of 85 Australians that joined on the same day uh, in 1905. And with the Australians came massive amount of musical talent and other talents. Uh, the stringed instrument manufacturers were from Australia, the people that they started their own zoo. And uh, here's pictures of some of the uh, zoo animals, the bear, uh, lions, um, they had uh, monkeys, they had exotic animals, uh, they had birds from all over the world. Um, they had a giant uh, beer gardens. They were the first ones to serve alcohol after prohibition was abolished this side of the Mississippi River um, in their park. So they really, really were cutting edge as far as uh, entertainment and uh, ways to make money, even though it was a religious fa uh, factor, they, uh, they were definitely outside the box. Uh, they're very closely related to the Shakers, uh, but of course they were, they were way more public and flamboyant than the Shakers were. Uh, there's photos of some of the buildings from their park uh, they had, they built their own little race cars uh, for the amusement park. Uh, fascinating stuff. They built the very first that uh, Lewis and Albert Boschke, who were the two first people to join the House of David faith. They actually invented the first automobile in America. It talks about it right there. First auto built. And there's the great grandson standing next to the auto, which is in the American Automobile Museum now. So they were inventors of many things. Uh, they invented the pen setting machine and sold the rights to Brunswick. Uh, they invented the cross propeller system for cruise ships uh, because they lost two, two cruise ships themselves on the Lake Michigan in unexpected early storms. Um, they invented the process of putting grape juice in a can, and they invented the waffle cone, which everybody's had a waffle cone. Um, great minds, great, great piece of Michigan history. This is a, a photo of their amphitheater at nighttime, all lit up and beautiful. On Wednesday nights, they had Wednesday night amateur night, and... Um, they uh, took talent from all over. Anyone that wanted to come perform on stage, they had a trial, kind of like American Idol and the voice kind of combination of the two uh, where you could try out 
and if you uh, want a chance, then you would perform against dozens of other people. And uh, Wednesday night after Wednesday night, eventually, uh, that's exactly where that took place and how it took place. You can see the huge crowds of people. Um, and then eventually the, the winners of those amateur nights would go on to Broadway and, and become famous. So pretty good stuff. Um, there's a poster of uh, one of the baseball teams. They, in 1914, they started playing baseball and they did it out of a pastime uh, of basically being a lot of teenage boys with a lot of pent up energy. <laughs> Um, they couldn't be with the opposite sex because they didn't believe in uh, procreation or marriage. And so they had a, had a lot of guys sitting around bored. And so they started playing baseball and they became really great baseball players. They started in 1914. By 1915, they won the uh, state of Michigan championship. By 1917, they were in the Spalding uh, Baseball Digest, which is like the Bible of baseball. And uh, by 1919, they were on the front page of the New York Times and, and began to take over the nation in barnstorming baseball leagues. And uh, they could take on anybody and everybody. And often they won 70% of their games year after year for 40 years. Um, it's one of the most famous parts of the story is the baseball part. Um, they also had bowling teams. They uh, had basketball teams. Um, there's a wall of their basketball history. Uh, the guys were considered professional basketball players back in the 20s and 30s. And uh, some crazy, long-haired, funny-looking basketball players. But they were super good. They could take on any team out there and win most of the games. Uh, there's a, a collage of a bunch of the musicians and um, it's just, it's great history all here in Michigan. They had over a hundred thousand acres of farmland. Um, they had hotels and restaurants and cruise ships on the Great Lakes and trolley cars, bus lines, a diamond mine in Sydney, Australia, a gold mine in Western Oklahoma, a coal mine in uh, Kentucky during World War I when Woodrow Wilson tried to ration uh, the use of coal. The House of David was generated in their own electricity with coal fired turbine engines. So they just went down and bought their own coal mine. And then they started selling electricity to the city of Benton Harbor. And uh, and very enterprising people. There's a picture of Babe Ruth pulling one of the House of David guy's whiskers. And uh, there's the letter from when he was going to play. Uh, if he showed up, how much they would get. And if he didn't show up, how much of the gate they would get. Um, Babe Ruth put on fake whiskers and played for the House of David and just a small handful of games. Um, it's just a, a massive amount of history. It's, it was written about in every major media in the country uh, from the beginning of the House of David all the way up until today. Um, anyway, the, uh, the story is powerful. I don't know if, um, if you want me to talk the entire time or if, if uh, you want to ask questions, but um, I'm open to whatever you want me to do. There's, uh, I can hear somebody clicking on. <laughs> that would be me. Uh, okay. if you, if you have more to talk about, that would certainly be okay. okay. If not, we can certainly take questions. Yep. Yep. I can talk more. I just didn't know. I didn't know if I should keep talking or not. <laughs> okay yes ab yeah. absolutely feel free okay. thanks okay uh part of their faith was that man is supposed to be in the likeness of jesus they quoted a scripture in leviticus that uh thou shall not round thy face nor thy chin i think uh something to that effect and so you could see 
they all had long hair. They didn't cut their hair. The men didn't cut their hair ever. So by the time they were teenagers, they had waist length hair. And when they played baseball, they put their hair in braids and put it up in the big poofy ball caps. And uh, there's a, a book written about just their baseball teams. Um, and uh, I did get um, more books in a couple of days ago. Um, there's a stack of my books. I have a couple hundred available right now. There's a book that was written in 1996 called Baseball's Bearded Boys, which is a really great book about the baseball team. And uh, it's just, it's written about everywhere, which is exciting. Uh, there's a, a, a piece that shows their early ba basketball teams, uh, House of David versus Broadway Clowns. They, uh, they also traveled with the, I know I'm getting a glare here, but the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, and they even had the Harlem Globetrotters baseball team in the 30s. Um, some of the trophies that they won, they, they invented the first night lighting system for baseball in 1930 and traveled the country with it. And so they lit up stadiums for the first time ever with what they called night baseball. See that poster right there? There's a photo of their telescoping lighting system. And uh, 1931, 1932, because of the House of David, they played games, twilight games. And uh, that's what that trophy is from one of the big tournaments in the twilight uh, games. And by 1933, teams around the country figured out they could build their own lighting systems for their stadiums. They didn't have to rely on the House of David to show up with their special lighting system, but it was a, a very cool time in history. And uh, um, they're given credit for breaking the attendance records all over America for uh, their oddity on the field, for their uh, talent, and f having the biggest crowds ever in the history of city after city after city, mainly because they were, they were very unique. They were, there's a, they were just super cool to watch. There's a, what they call a junior team, which is all young guys, uh, but you can see the hair, um, 1926. Um, they, they really were a huge draw and, and they were talented. They could make you laugh while they beat you. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a huge part of the, of the story. Um, there's a House of David Blues piece, um, which was 1923 as well. Uh, Super cool graphics. Uh, they had blues bands, syncopate bands, jazz bands, orchestras, men's orchestras, ladies' orchestras. Um, there's a, a really neat photo of their art department. They made their own beautiful statuary to sell in their amusement park. Their amusement park was considered a pre-Disneyland type amusement park, which is considered one of the busiest in the nation uh, for many, many decades. And uh, they sold those statues in the amusement park, as well as uh, selling wooden souvenirs that they made, um, mirrors like this one, their own music, their own stringed instruments, uh, pennants and shirts, that they, everything was made right there at the park. Um, again, there's Babe Ruth with some whiskers uh, when he was playing for the House of David. Uh, they had their own bowling uh, league uh, that represented their preserve department, which they had a jam and jelly factory. And um, amongst so many other industries, uh, there's, they had the world's largest cold storage building, which uh, they were considered one of the leading fruit distribution places on the planet. Uh, during the late 20s all the way through the 50s. Um, and that again was, you can see the writing, House of David, cold storage, which later became 20 times that big. And uh, uh, here's just a pile of about a hundred 
rare posters that I acquired from uh, some guys that are kind of like the American pickers out east. And all they do is buy huge estates and then find out who buys the items. So a lot of those are Negro League posters from when the blacks couldn't play in the majors because they were black. The House of David couldn't play in the majors because they wouldn't shave. And they weren't going to shave because they thought their whiskers were part of getting them to heaven. So um, there's a really cool, rare, rare piece uh, from there. Um, there's a really rare poster from their baseball, uh, basketball teams. So it's just amazing stuff. The, uh, the baseball pieces are highly sought after. Um, ESPN considered my baseball part of my museum as one of the three, uh, number three in the top baseball uh, museums in the North American continent, only behind uh, Cooperstown Hall of Fame and the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, which is pretty awesome. Um, I love the baseball part. The, uh, there's a picture in the middle, if you can see, is Joe Lewis. He was a world champion heavyweight boxer. He actually trained at the House of David Park. He had a building there uh, where he worked out and worked out with the House of David guys. And he loved baseball. So after boxing, he started his own uh, uh, Joe Lewis Brown Bombers baseball team. Um, there's another picture of him with a couple of the House of David guys. And uh, they had their own, like I said, they had their own vegetarian restaurants. There's a menu. Uh, from one of the restaurants. Um, great for food from what everybody's always told me. Um, there's a view of some of the items on the menu. And uh, some of the wooden souvenirs that they made, wood burnings. They had a building in the 1933-34 Chicago World's Fair where they sold these souvenirs and propaganda to get people to come to the House of David to enjoy the amusement park. And this room is packed full of the pearlized ivory uh, statuary that the House of David made themselves. And it's all finished with ground up fish scales for a finish. Uh, entirely unique to them, started in uh, 23. And in 1965, the art department burned to the ground, sadly, um, and they never rebuilt it. So that's a cool picture of the guys in the art department working away, picking off the little chips and polishing things. The big statues were never sold, they were just for their own use and sadly when the art department burned to the ground everything inside was lost so um, there's a photo of the artist pouring the molds some of the artisans showing their works uh, little uh, wooden animated dolls this uh, photo is a famous photo that was in the 1944 National Geographic magazine that talked about the House of David Park. Um, there's, uh, there's their building from the 1933 Chicago World's Fair where they sold souvenirs to literally tens of thousands of people. If you look on the bottom, you can read the World's Fair details and uh, beautiful stuff. The uh, amusement park, like I said, it was a, a pre-Disneyland type park. Uh, you could go there and ride the trains for a nickel. You could buy a waffle cone for a nickel. Um, you could listen to the music and watch the entertainment all day long for free. So you didn't have to have money to, to go there and enjoy it. There's a, a giant six foot panoramic picture of 1919 of the amusement, the valley of the amusement park. If, if you can see all the people, it's packed and they came off of cruise ships 
and they came and traveled by car and horse and carriage at this time um, to participate in the House of David entertainment there. That's a, a, a giant silent movie theater that existed until 1921 when it started to fall into a wet area underneath it and started to tip and it tore the place down. And uh, here's the one of two in the world, uh, the, phono the phonograph from the silent movie theater. It's huge, uh, it's taller than me, so it's about six feet tall. And uh, it's amazing piece. The only other one is in the Henry Ford Museum. It's got a place where the needles were stored. Um, it changes its own needles with that head right there. Um, it's got a powerful music system in the bottom of it that pulls out for sound. Amazing piece. Um, my daughter will probably buy a new house someday when I'm gone with that. But anyway, cool stuff. Um, just a lot of great pieces. They made their own music. They made their own records, House of David Blues, all kinds of jazz uh, music and uh, big band music, all that, all that type of thing. Um, we talk about night baseball here. And uh, it, was a, it was considered the world championship baseball team for many, many years because they could beat anybody and everybody. They would take on teams after the World Series. They would take on the World Series champion and often even beat those teams. So, but they loved playing baseball. They didn't do it just to win. They just loved playing baseball. There's a super cool picture of uh, House of David guy on uh, um, Noah Bennett on the back of a old Indian motorcycle. They were doing an advertisement for Indian back in the day. Um, some of the musical instruments again, and uh, lots of baseball stuff. So um, there's a little bit of everything. Sports Illustrated wrote an amazing story in 1970, 1970, I guess. Um, and they called it the hairiest team of all. Really fun story. They did a podcast a couple years ago. Um, there's been, if you Google House of David, You'll, you'll find quite a bit of neat stuff about them online um, and on YouTube, lots of stuff. There's one of their mansions, it's 32,000 square feet, 102 rooms. I gave tours there every Saturday at one o'clock for 15 years. Uh, amazing place. It's all closed down to the public now. Um, Benjamin and Mary, um, as they were proudly uh, Sharon, the House of David after 1906. Um, this is the part about the cruise ships. Um, that's a giant oar from there to there that came off of one of their three mass tall ship sailing ships that went down uh, in 1919. That's the only thing that's left. Um, but they did have three big cruise ships on the Great Lakes all of which went down in storms. Now they're on the bottom of the water. And uh, there's a cool story right here that talks about the family that was on the Titanic bound for the House of David, which I didn't even know about until about 10 years ago when the family contacted me doing genealogy study. And uh, come to find out the husband didn't make it the mom and the baby girl did, and they did come and make it and, and lived at the House of David for quite some years. Um, so that's why I have a little bit of the story of the Titanic in here. Um, they had their own 2,600 acre island in the middle of Lake Michigan called High Island. Uh, that's what this is about. It was a, a beautiful, beautiful island next to Beaver Island uh, where they timbered off the island because it had exotic huge timbers. Uh, you can see a massive pile of timbers here um, waiting for their big ship to take it back to 
uh, Benton Harbor and St. Joe, where they built houses in Bering County with high island timber. And uh, that was actually sold off to Warren Townsend from Grand Rapids in 1953 after Benjamin's death and the sawmill was closed. They didn't have any use for it anymore. Um, there's blueprints from the House of David Hotel, which is spectacular. It's like a grand hotel made of granite. And uh, there's a, a drawing of it when it was first being designed in 1921. Um, spectacular place. I have it listed right now for the owners for sale. Uh, there's Babe Didrickson. She was a female pitcher, considered the greatest female athlete in the world in the 1930s. She was Olympic gold medalist. She went on to pitch baseball games for the House of David and uh, traveled in her own car because she said the conditions on the House of David bus were too rough with those smelly guys with long hairs and whiskers and heavy wool suits and they'd go days without showers. <laughs> so she got to drive that pretty car of hers to every game. Um, Jam and Jelly, like I said, they, they won all kinds of awards for their amazing quality uh, jam and jelly uh, back in the 30s through the 60s. Uh, they were conscientious objectors of the war. During World War I, they didn't have to fight. There's a World War I soldier right there. They didn't have to go to war. They could cut, they could leave their hair long. Um, they had to work in the restaurants, the United States Army restaurants, and they had to work on the farms to supply the food. Um, there's a group of House of David guys at Camp Custer in Michigan during World War I. Sadly, during World War II, they were forced to fight. Even though they didn't want to fight, they were forced to fight. And my old friend Lloyd, the guy that lived in 99, he was the president of the House of David, he said it was the saddest time in his life because they wouldn't fight. And most all of them didn't make it home. So if they, if they were confronted with somebody, they just lay down their arm and, and get killed, sadly. So anyway, uh, there's a lot. <laughs> and um, I'm open for questions or discussion. I guess I don't want to just keep going on and on. So everybody, anybody, fire away whenever you're ready. Okay, we'll, um... Does it still exist? Yeah. Um, the members have all passed away. Um, they, uh, they all died off about a year and a half ago, the last one. And uh, Willie Robertson, who uh, amazingly, Willie was the last guy to join there. Um, in 1947 was the last time that they took new members. And uh, he came from Scotland. He was a clockmaker and he just died last year at like 97. He was the last member. So um, there's no, nobody alive there today. They, uh, the two caregivers that I introduced to the place about 10 years ago, they actually have gated it all off and made it their private property now. So um, I didn't, I couldn't see the other questions. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, scroll back. I don't know how to scroll back. Uh, let's see. Someone from Facebook is wondering about the origin of the group. Okay, they, uh, Benjamin, uh, like I said, Benjamin Purnell, he came from Paducah, Kentucky. Um, He's the, he's the originator of the House of David story itself, but the whole thing started in uh, England with Joanna Southcott in the 1700s. 
um, she was the very first person that talked about the millennialist type faith and that there were going to be seven messengers from God that were going to come to this earth in this type of faith uh, before paradise on earth would begin. And she was, she called herself the first of seven messengers. And then after that, there was George White, James Jezreel, John Rowe, Michael Mills. Um, there, were, there were six messengers total before Benjamin, but they all they originated from Great Britain and then uh, also Australia. Uh, question from Amy. Did they make their own baseball bats and balls? They made their own baseball bats. They did not make their own baseballs. They bought those uh, from, uh, I think actually Louisville Slugger um, supplied some of their bats, but they also supplied a lot of their baseballs too. So they did not make their own baseballs. Uh, from Kathy, uh, you said that one picture of Babe Ruth showed him with whiskers when he played for House of David. Did Babe join the group? Babe Ruth was offered more than anybody else offered him in the history of his baseball days. And I have a copy of the, of the contract that they offered him, but he was drinking a lot at the time. And his manager contacted the house of David baseball manager and told them that they probably shouldn't rely on the babe to show up every game. So they agreed to pay him a pretty heavy amount to, to play. If he showed up, this is how much he got. If he didn't show up, no big deal. So they didn't, they didn't advertise him with the team, but he did play like five exhibition games basically for them. I have some film footage of him uh, playing with the House of David, but it's, it's a rare time. I think it's something around 1934, 35. Okay, another question from Amy. How much did the pluralized ivory statues cost that they sold? Back when the amusement park was open, they sold those statues from anywhere from $5 to the most expensive, or I think about $50. Um, today they run anywhere on, you know, if you find them in a marketplace, um, in an auction environment, they go anywhere from 200 up to a couple thousand, depends on the piece and the rarity. They're very, very rare. They're considered Art Deco now and they're very, 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 very collectible. Okay. Uh, from Heidi, what was the newspaper article under that large picture saying, tearing the veil? Was there a controversy? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Um, I try to avoid that, but uh, yeah. Uh, um, Benjamin was um, pursued and uh, eventually caught. Uh, he went into hiding for four years. He was pursued by the feds and the state police and the local sheriff uh, for charges. Uh, I think about uh, 13 girls uh, accused him of rape or wrongdoing. And uh, so they eventually caught up with him in his Diamond House mansion, which is about a 9,000 square foot stone mansion that he had. Um, they caught up with him in 1926. Uh, he went into hiding in 22. And, and it was the most sensationalized trial of the 20th century. Um, I used to have a 1600 plus page uh, court document that talked about all the testimony and the whole, the whole entire trial. Um, he was acquitted of those charges. He was found guilty for operating a religion under false pretenses for personal gain. But before they could sentence him, he died. He died of tuberculosis. While he was on trial, he was on a, in a, on, laying in a hospital bed during the trial. And that story uh, appeared in 1923 and 1924 in, a, in a, a newspaper out of Great Britain called the American Weekly, where they had, they had an insider at the House of David that was sharing with them the fact that there were tunnels underneath the big mansions and that's probably where Ben was hiding and 
there's quite a number of full fold out front page stories about all the very controversial times back in, in that per time period. Okay. Okay, from Bill Hayes in Clawson, Michigan. Uh, this is just a comment. We met you at your museum in January 2001. We bought a book from you, Brother Benjamin, A History of the Israelite House of David. You gave us some information on a couple of people that still lived in the big mansion, and we were able to visit a man and a woman that still lived there. Great museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, they're both gone okay. now, but that it's a very unique time in history that I was very blessed to be able to be a part of and, and to share with people like Bill. I took thousands mm -hmm. of people through the Shiloh mansion and and sadly it's all closed down now, but at least there's a lot of people that got to feel it, see it, meet the members. Mm -hmm. uh, from Facebook, <clears throat> I am interested if there is anything in the museum showing the cult in its infancy, pictures of founders, recruitment, etc. Thousands. Yep, yep. I have probably 40,000 pieces here at the museum. So yeah, there's a oh. massive amount of that stuff. Okay. Uh, from Facebook, how did Chris get interested in the House of David? I'm a history addict. <laughs> um, I, I love history. I have since high school, I majored in history in college. And uh, I came home to study local history because it's not something that they teach you at most any level, sadly. And thank God there was a lot uh, uh, available uh, to, to tell me that our most powerful piece of local history was here, right here uh, at the house of David. And, um, I studied it. I went everywhere researching it. And, uh, and then at the time there was a pretty good handful of house of David members still alive. And in the beginning they were reluctant to talk, but then within a year's time, they were welcoming me there and calling to see if I was going to come. And so I just went every day, sometimes for hours a day and picking their brain. And, uh, just after spending eight years of college and doing cramming for exams and studying, uh, you know, I, I, I had a, a real passion to dump everything I could into my mind from these people. And they, at that time of their life, I think I just hit them at the perfect time where they wanted somebody to know and somebody that they trusted to, to tell the story. So that's a long answer to your question, but that's why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Sue, did marriage become allowed eventually? Um, not really, no. Um, they did have in 1914 and I think a little bit, maybe 1917, they had what they called group weddings where they would do forced marriages with the uh, uh, teenage girls with some of the um, male House of David members. And I don't know the reason why that was because those people really weren't married. They didn't live together. They didn't act like husband and wife. Um, you know, there's stories about why that happened, but I don't want to go into that. But uh, for the most part, um, no, they didn't allow marriage like um in the very last years maybe the last 25 years of their existence they would allow people to uh be together that wanted a, a man and a woman they could uh they could call themselves husband and wife like uh, uh paul johnson and uh, lily johnson uh, paul came from washington and uh he was allowed to uh, share housing with a female. Uh, Wil Wilma Estes and Bob Estes it was a very small handful of people that were allowed to do that. And I don't know why, but there weren't very many. You could count them on one hand. <clears throat> uh, from Heidi, they had strict rules. Were people frequently excommunicated? 
And does that stone mansion where he hid still exist? The stone mansion definitely exists. Um, when he died in 1927, they, it was total shock and pandemonium because here's the guy that was teaching them that they would live forever. They would have eternal life of the body if they believed in his teachings. He never taught that he was going to die and he, of course, died. And so they were in shock. Um, they didn't have much dissension because of his death because they didn't have home to go home to. Um, that was their home. So they stayed right there and um, lived out their lives. They, they, uh, they also thought because he taught that he was uh, like this, basically a brother to Christ, um, that he would rise again like Jesus. So they kept him wrapped in damp, warm towels for eight days until the Barron County coroner came in and said, you either bury the guy or we're going to bury him. And so they embalmed his body and they put him in a hermetically sealed glass coffin where he's still at to this day in the Diamond House Mansion, that stone mansion. So he's there. Um, and the second part of your question about excommunicating, um, if people got unruly, they were sent to High Island to uh, kind of have a come to Jesus talk. <laughs> uh, and if they were allowed to come back and they got unruly again, um, then, they, then they were disbarred uh, and uh, disbanded and they would be given a one-way bus ticket and $10 to go wherever they wanted to go. But they didn't get anything back. When you joined, you gave them all your worldly possessions. And that was in exchange for a promise of everlasting life. So if you decided next year, 10 years from now, this isn't quite what I thought it was going to be. That's, that's all on you. You don't get anything back. You get $10 and a one-way bus ticket back home to where they're probably going to say, you know, not good things about you because you just gave everything you had to the, to this faith. So a lot of people didn't leave. Most people didn't leave. They, that, that became home forever. And they actually loved it there. The one, everyone that I ever talked to, uh, the members were like happy as, as little kids. They loved it. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Stephanie, do you ever have any hope of opening the mansion for tours again? Yes, like constantly, I hope. <laughs> I hope, I pray, but it's not in my control anymore. Um, sadly, I introduced two guys that I knew that were, uh, one guy was assistant manager of my museum and another guy was an antiquing buddy of mine and I trusted them to put them in, in a position of caring for the elders and which they did, but then afterwards they joined and made the whole thing private so I have no control of any of that and I just I just pray that someday they'll they'll realize they're doing a massive injustice to everybody and uh, the sad thing is that as the elders were passing they inherited 217 million dollars from their colony in Australia and uh, where the diamond mine was and so they're very well oiled now, where it never was like that the whole time, the whole 25 years I was with those people, they were always struggling. And uh, so now these two guys are sitting on that whole mountain of money. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I pray to God they'll take mm -hmm. 50 million and move to some island <laughs> and let us show that place again. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, from Amy. Uh, Chris, are you from that area? Yep. Born and raised. Yep. Okay. Um, this is another one from Bill from earlier that visited the museum. Uh, tell us about the divorce and Mary taking over. Where is Benjamin buried? Okay, there was no divorce. Um, 
Benjamin died in 27, still married to Mary, except they weren't on the best of terms at that time. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's a kind of a thick, <laughs> a, a whole thick drama that happened after that. Of course, she should have got everything. She was the wife. She was the one that came to Michigan with Ben and started the house of David. So rightfully everything should have gone to her in my mind, but it was a religious corporation. And the judge that defended Benjamin during the trial, the big sensationalized trials of 27, he was a retired Supreme Court judge from California. And he kind of got the idea that this is all, this is all his now. That's what he decided. He wanted it all. And I think he knew enough uh, from what Benjamin had shared with him as a, as a trustee to, to burn Mary. And so he took Mary to court and they had a huge uh, trial all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court. He won. So they awarded the House of David to Judge Dewhurst, H. Harry Thomas Dewhurst, and Mary was forced to leave. So they evicted Mary in 1928. And at that time, they hid all their money. So she was awarded half of whatever was in the bank which at the time she got like 80,000 cash and she got, you know, a small amount of holdings. And that's when she started the house of David as reorganized by Mary Purnell, which later become Mary's city of David. She died in 53. And today there's one person left there. Uh, from Suzanne, did they accept poor people or did they need a certain amount of wealth? They know they accepted anybody that if you, if you, they had a, you know, they had like a 14 point questionnaire that they would uh, require their members to uh, pass. And uh, they took everybody that was interested in joining. It didn't matter what your income was or your knowledge level was, but because of the fact that they had all these people from uh, Australia, Great Britain, the Netherlands, Italy, France, Spain, that were kind of waiting for the arrival of the seventh messenger, they flocked in big time. And because they were ex very wealthy, very highly intelligent, they, they took up a lot of space there. And so by 19, by the late late 1920s when Benjamin was kind of clocked out they just they they felt like they didn't have room anymore for people they didn't want to build any more big mansions which they used for housing um, and so they just stopped taking new members and then they trickled in until 1947 when that last guy Willie Robertson joined but they needed people to they needed people to run the park they needed people to drive the trains they needed people to work on their farms, they had 100,000 acres of farmland. They needed cooks in their restaurants and seamstresses and you know, gardeners and artists and uh, musicians. And so they really were open to somebody, if they wanted to come there, really needed to devote, devote their life to the cause and do what they were asked to do. A uh, few more left uh, from Heidi. Uh, anyone left in the Australian colony? No, when the last lady in Australia died, I think she was, I don't know, she may be 97 years old. Um, she had been the last one standing for quite some time and she just passed away about, it must have been about seven or eight years ago. And once she passed away, that's when all that wealth, that 217 million was moved to here, to Benton Harbor, Michigan, from their Australian bank account. So there's nobody left really at either, either place, but they shut the one down in Australia completely. Uh, did they have church services? They did, they didn't have a church. They didn't have, you know, like uh, a brick and mortar uh, building, but they gave outside sermons and inside Paul 
like the big giant uh the mansions had big meeting halls inside them and and uh yeah benjamin and some of the they called them the messengers they would give saturday and sunday services and they would give they would give often weather permitting they would give them in front of thousands of people that were there for the park uh, benjamin would stand on the balconies of that big shiloh mansion and speak his message to anybody and everybody that would listen uh how did all these other countries learn about this group in michigan did they evangelize they did um they you know they they it was a lineage of uh churches that one followed the other uh through the first second third fourth fifth sixth messengers all awaiting the seventh messenger and finally when benjamin arrived uh to michigan um in their teachings they always taught that the seventh and final messenger would come to the new world well you know we know the new world is america according to history and so they knew it was going to be or they were told it was going to be uh, american born and benjamin uh, came along the boschke brothers who were like bill gates uh mega wealthy guys from uh, benton harbor michigan that had the second leading wagon factory in america behind studebaker and they had been studying under the sixth messenger's faith and had a church in grand rapids that they attended because of that with some extremely wealthy farmers up there uh, that they were part of a group and so they paid to send telegraphs telegrams or whatever the word is all over the world that here he is he's arrived come here now quickly you know so it was kind of like it was kind of like the announcement of the second coming of Christ. You know, it's, I, I, I think it's very close to that, where if you're a believer in, in Christianity, then you think that Christ is coming back. If you have somebody that you fully trust that said, you know, Jesus is here, he's, you know, he's wherever and meeting and talking to people, hurry up, get here now. You know, you would probably drop what you're doing and come. And that's what they did. And they flocked from all over the whole planet. Okay. Uh, from Tina, I became interested in the house of David because of the baseball side of things. Then I became very interested in their story after following a distant relative through the census from Tennessee early on to Oklahoma and then to Michigan, where he was listed in the census as the manager of Mary's City of David Hotel. Hmm. Yes. Uh, great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from Heidi. Were those who joined all provided a place to live? They were. Yep, they were. And uh, um, most of the very early converts were, were given beautiful uh, rooms in, Shiloh, in the big Shiloh mansion or Jerusalem or the Bethlehem mansions. Um, and then as the place filled up, uh, they put people in uh, the Ark building. They would put people in their own hotel uh, until the tourists came in the summer. And then they would send them off either to High Island to work up there. They'd send them out to a farm. They had tons of housing all over Michigan, cabin, log cabins. or But they absolutely always had free housing, always had free food. They never had to want for anything. They were always furnished everything that they wanted. And in exchange, you know, they were, uh, you know, they did what they could do to survive, to wait till tomorrow. And they thought tomorrow was paradise, but yeah, absolutely. They were always given housing. Okay. Uh, from Facebook, what happened to the animals when the zoo closed? Um, after World War II ended, for some reason, the government visited the House of David and said, because of the proximity of the zoo to the House of David restaurant, they couldn't have a zoo anymore. They didn't think it was safe to have a zoo there. And so they'd sent all the uh, zoo animals to the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. And that's, that was the end of the House of David Zoo back in 45, I think. Uh, from Heidi, were they allowed to work outside of the church 
and how did they decide who the messenger How did they decide what? I'm sorry. Who the messengers were. Okay. Um, yes, they were like uh, after the war, mainly after world after World War One, in the twenties, they were allowed to go work in different factions of Benton Harbor. Uh, they were allowed to work uh, on the on the trolley car businesses. They were allowed to do things like that. They uh, they had to come back and give their money to the House of David, but they were allowed. Some of them were allowed. Uh, to do that and then um uh they were later on uh starting like in the 50s they were actually allowed to make their own money so if you wanted to go in the evening and be an electrician or if you wanted to play on a, on a in a band somewhere outside the colony you were allowed to do that and you were allowed to keep your money and uh um and then as far as the messenger part every saturday uh in the foyer in the shiloh mansion they would have huge heated debates about uh people that were considered religious scholars amongst the group and so they would figure out who knew the faith the best and uh early on of course benjamin picked those people but then later on uh they kind of picked them amongst each other so uh, they had they had many many groups of messengers that traveled the country and in horse and carriage and later in 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 model T's and model A's uh, to preach the word. Okay, another from Heidi. Did their money come from their industry or did they have wealthy member jo members join or both or both. good investments? Both, both. Yeah, both. they both. they were. Ex they're extremely intelligent. They invested extremely well. Like Lloyd, Lloyd Dallager, um, he was, uh, I don't know, can you see that? Uh, my book right there. Um, that's Lloyd, uh, the guy with the whisker, long whiskers. Anyway, Lloyd, uh, Lloyd lived, he wanted to live to be a hundred. He's the guy, he was kind of like my adopted grandpa. Um, he's the one that took me under his wing. He, he came in 1918 from Canada. He played baseball from 26 to 40. Um, he drove the trains. He ran the power plant. Um, super lovable, funny, funny guy. Um, he started investing in uh, stocks way back when commercial airlines first became commercial airlines and uh and stocks like that and when he died i think i think his stocks were worth like a million five or something uh so yeah they could invest their own money the money went to the house of david after he passed he never wanted to cash out um, but they could spend their own money they could they could invest the way they wanted okay uh, what was the largest number of people living there at one time? And do you know if they believed in the Trinity? Um, the largest number of people there at, at the main area was just over 1,400. There were uh, over 4,000 that I've found uh, worldwide. Um, but right there at Benton Harbor, there was just over 1,400. And uh, they believed in uh, God and Jesus, so they were uh, they were Christians. Um, but I don't know. Okay, uh, from Facebook, was it a multiracial community? Um, that's a tough question in today's world. <laughs> um, in the very beginning, they weren't. Um, even though they took people from all over the whole globe that joined, they didn't really ever have any uh, blacks that tried to join um, until the 50s. And then they did take some then. Uh, in the very beginning, they didn't, they didn't encourage that uh, because of Benjamin's uh, deep south 
upbringing. Um, but then uh, by the 1920s, by the time 1920 came around and they started playing baseball, and they started playing uh, baseball. They were the only white team to play in the Negro Leagues. They really, they kind of turned that all around. And so they would play games uh, all over America. By 1927, 28, they were considered one of the greatest teams in America. Greatest barnstorming team there ever was back then, according to history. And they would uh, team up with the Kansas City Monarchs or the Homestead Grays and play double headers, triple headers around the country. And they would show up to uh, towns across America for a triple header. <clears throat> and the town would think it was just going to be their team against the House of David. And they would show up early and uh, they would go to the manager's office and uh, three guys would go in there and just announce that, that, you know, to the baseball manager of that, of that stadium that, you know, Hey, we're excited that this town is packed full, like a festival. We're so proud that there's so many people here waiting for us to play ball and we're going to put on a heck of a show. And, you know, they'd stand in front of the barbershop and throw their, long hair around and they braid each other's beards in front of the barber shop and they dance and play music in the streets and just get people fired up and you know they they'd tell the manager all that and they'd say yeah, here's the deal mr manager we know that you don't normally allow this uh black team from kansas city to come here and uh but here's the deal they're in our other bus sitting right outside your town limit and they're going to play you guys first. And we, we're going to have them come to the restaurant tonight that we always eat in, that they're not allowed to be in. And we rented hotel rooms for them too, in the hotel that we always stay in. And if you can't get all that approved for them to play the first game against you guys, and we're going to play the second game, that's okay. That's okay. Mr. Manager, because there's, a, there's another team in another town just down the road that are waiting on a uh, rain check to play us. They're excited to play us. So that's fine. If you don't want to play us, we're going to go on down the road. And Lloyd, Lloyd would tell the story to me a, a lot. He loved it. He would tell it to all my visitors there. And, uh, you know, he, Lloyd would say, Chris, the room would be completely silent. Either that or they'd scream, they'd throw their clipboards, they'd storm out and slam the door. And But guess what? Every time they would come back and say something to the effect of, okay, House of David, we'll play these guys that you want us to play and, and we'll make all this happen, but don't you ever expect to be back in our town again? And Lloyd told me, he said, Chris, these Kansas City Monarchs or these black teams would put on a show. They would make they they'd make these these towns people be at standing ovations during the game, and they'd have them laughing. And when we played them, they would be it'd be like the Fourth of July, like fireworks going off. And we tip well in the restaurants, and we took good care of the hotel rooms. And guess what? Next year, town after town after town they'd invite both of us back. So, you know, that, so that's a long answer to your story about <laughs> allowing blacks in the house of David. They actually were cutting edge before their time about drawing a line in the sand about color. They really, in the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, really gives huge credit for the house of David is the team that helped break the color barrier way before Jackie Robinson broke into the majors. The House of David was teaching America that, that black baseball was pretty dang awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next two are, are kind of related uh, from Heidi and Kathy. Were there ever children in this group? Did married couples or single people with children ever join? Did any members ever have children together while part of this group? And then Kathy asked, what was their strategy for keeping the cult alive if their members couldn't have children? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so they could join 
married, they could join married with 10 kids. Um, but from the time they joined until paradise on earth, they had to be like brother and sister. So the men lived in certain mansions and the women lived in different mansions and the kids were separated until they were 14. I mean, they were, they were living in the ark uh, children's building until they were 14, then they were separated. So they definitely had children come there. And those children, a lot of them are the last ones that just died recently. Um, they, uh, they weren't supposed to procreate. They were celibate, but, you know, there was probably about six oops babies that came out of there. And I was friends with two of them. And uh, just up until they passed, not very many years ago, uh, if somebody got pregnant, um, they, they were shunned. They were moved away from the colony to have their baby. Sometimes they could come back. Um, oftentimes they were sent to High Island. Uh, and that was not a pleasant experience. But uh, there you go. Okay, one last question did, from Heidi. Did any House of David players go on to the regular major leagues? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, Tony Zitta played for the Detroit Tigers. Uh, Paul Mooney was recruited to go play for the Cubs with a huge contract, and uh, he denied it because he wouldn't shave or cut his hair. Um, uh you know, Grover Cleveland Alexander was a pro that, that joined the House of David team. He wasn't a House of David guy that went pro. Um, there were a couple guys in the history that, that were, uh, I'm drawing a blank, I'm sorry, but there were a couple people that made it pretty big in the majors. There was a lot of major player, major league players that were offered huge contracts to grow their whiskers and come play for the House of David. So there was more of that that happened. That was oh, that comes to the end of our question. That was a great uh, question and answer session. Uh, we really had some good ones there. So I'd like to thank you, Chris, uh, for your time tonight and for sharing uh, all of your knowledge with us. Uh, Chris does have a museum in St. Joe's, the House of David Baseball Museum. Uh, we do have a couple of books I included in the links uh, in the chat here uh, that we own in the library system that you can check out uh, if you'd like more details. Uh, you can search them in our catalog or the links are there. Uh, so thanks. Have Very a good welcome. Evening. Hey, you too. Thanks, you Chris. guys have some great questions. Excellent. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay. Good night. Good night.